Welcome everyone. Uh, I am Sarah Ledford. I'm one of the board of directors for Quasi, and I want to thank you all for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it happens to be for you, for our virtual pop-up talks. Many thanks to all of our speakers. Ah. <laughs> yeah, right, Linda? No, <laughs> I got nervous. <laughs> what do I do? What do I you're, do? You're fine. You'll stay quiet until your slide comes up. <laughs> well, I, I pressed something. There you are. Okay. Okay. I don't know. I'm technically totally an expert. That's okay. Do you know if you have the ability to mute yourself in the meantime? Do I press more? You can um, mute me. You can mute me. You mute me. All right. Mute. Yes, perfect. We got that. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So panelists, um, first off, welcome everyone. As a reminder, this session is being recorded. Um, we have 13 speakers today, which means we're probably going to have some time for questions at the end. So I want to encourage the audience to use the question and answer function, not the chat, to list any, send any questions and make sure you indicate which speaker you're addressing your question to. Um, uh, panelists, if you have any links that you want to share with the entire audience, do that in the chat, making sure you update who you're sending it to, to both panelists and uh, attendees. So these pop-up talks are going to be three minutes each, and I will be timing. We have a little bit of flexibility. Panelists, I will be updating you on your time in the chat, um, and we'll probably give you until about three and a half minutes before I, you know, really uh, indicate that it's time to move on. Um, all right. So with that, uh, we are going to get started. Uh, Zaneb, our first speaker is Zaneb Mohammadi with uh, elucidating interest storm variations in suspended sediment sources using a Bayesian fingerprinting approach. So take it away. Hello, everybody. I'm Zaina from University of Tehran, Iran. Uh, thank you to having me. My title is Elucidating Inter-Storm Variation in Suspended Sediment Sources Using a Bayesian Fingerprinting Approach. And it had recently published in the Journal of Hydrology. There is, in, in, uh, there is an increasing need for reliable uh, information on the origin of fine grain sediment transported by river system, but uh, critically at temporal scale that reflected uh, reflect the timing and uh, pattern of sediment mobilization and delivery in response to effective precipitation events. Accordingly, the main objective of this study was to investigate uh, the temporal variability um, the temporal variability of sediment sources during and uh, between flood events in a mountainous catchment in Iran, uh, using a geochemical fingerprinting approach and Bayesian unmixing model. Potential sediment sources were classified as either tributary sub-Bayesian special and uh, members or individual source types represented by surface soils and channel banks. A total of 34 geochemical elements, elemental ratios, and weathering in the seas were measured as potential tracer on a total of 155 samples, including 40 target samples collected across the hydrograph of, uh, for flood even at the overall catchment outlet. The Bayesian on mixing uh, model uh, result revealed a pronounced uh, set inter storm variation in the uh, relieved um, in the relief uh, in the relative uh, contributions from both the special source and source types for all the suspended sediment sample uh, collected throughout the series small to medium size even the subcatchment one the middle of a stream subcatchment was the major 84 percent to 99 uh, percent sediment source while for the largest sample event suspended sediment samples uh, predominantly uh, originated from the sub uh, subcatchment tree the most source and subcatchment by investigating both uh, special sources and source type, temporal variation in the uh, dominant uh, sources were relieved. Uh, quaternary geology and uh, channel banks were identified as the main sediment sources, while the use of a special source and members 
in a, is a practical in the medium-sized range uh, basins. Integration uh, with estimates of sediment source uh, type uh, contributions is more informative uh, informative to manager in uh, selecting re uh, relevant sediment integration methods. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A and we will answer them as we can at the end of the session uh, to the audience. Next up, we have Morgan Thull with modeling uh, transpiration with machine learning. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm a master's student at Portland State University beginning my thesis project, um, which will be an investigation of the use of machine learning methods to model transpiration. Transpiration can be a key component of the water balance, but can it, it can also be difficult to measure. There are empirical methods for predicting it based on meteorological variables, most famously the pendant monteith equation. I'd like to try some machine learning methods to see how they compare to empirical methods, and more importantly, I want to use them to gather insights about how we should be modeling transpiration in different locations and species. So I have a collection of environmental data from a eucalyptus plantation in southeast Australia including average transpiration data that was collected using SAPFLUX sensors. This data was provided by Edo Daly and his team at Monash University in Australia. There were two data sets, one from 2017 to 2018, and then another in a separate location from 2019 to 2020. I used this data to build a um, support vector machine, which is a type of machine learning model that predicts transpiration using the measured values as a benchmark for uh, performance. The graph shows just a subset of my model. Um, it shows measured transpiration in orange and then predicted transpiration in blue over time. I used a feature importance test to determine the dominant environmental variables that determines transpiration. So this test shows the relative importance of each variable and it's normalized to one for each model. So larger numbers would indicate more important variables for the prediction. The results of this test for each model, so the 2017 to 2018, the 2019 to 2020, and then the combined model are shown in the top right of my slide. So just from these preliminary results, we can see the groundwater levels um, and water availability in the form of soil moisture may play a more important role in transpiration in some locations than the unmodified penman monteith equation would suggest. Sorry for the background noise also, it's my dog. Luna. Um, so the 2017 to 2018 data was further up in the catchment away from the stream so we could hypothesize that access to groundwater is more important in predicting transpiration due to water access perhaps with a more pronounced effects in the summer months i split up the models by season and early resorts seem to support this claim um, just from the first few models we can learn something useful about the system as well as create a working model for prediction but this is only the beginning of the project, and I have plans to analyze the model further, attempt other machine learning methods, and compare performance to empirical methods. Um, and of course, the model that only applies in one species in one specific region of Australia is not particularly useful. So a big goal of this project is to generalize the model to new data. If anyone has a large amount of transpiration data, uh, particularly at half hour intervals or less, I would be really interested in working with your data set and providing insights on it. And you can contact me at my Portland State email address, which is shown there, Morthel at pdx.edu. Uh, thank you for your time. Wonderful. So use the Q&A to either ask Morgan questions or tell her about your data sets. All right, next we have Charles Scaff with Improving Vegetation Drought Response and Recovery in Hydrologic Models. Yeah, thanks. Hey, everyone, my name is Charles Scaff. And I'm a recent graduate from the University of Virginia and currently an ORISE fellow at the US Department of Energy in Washington, DC. Today, I want to share how we can improve vegetation drought response in hydrologic models and why it's important. So going to panel one, in eco-hydrologic models, the leaf controls how much water is conducted from the soil, through the tree, and into the atmosphere. However, plant physiology tells us that some species may limit conductance in the stem, particularly during and after drought. But eco-hydrologic models don't capture this stem conductance. 
which means models miss important vegetation behavior during droughts. In panel two, Domek and others showed stem conductance of oaks and red maples decreased as soils dried. However, this decrease was much more dramatic, right, in oak species under mild soil droughts as shown by the soil water section on the x-axis, and also as shown by the dashed line and triangles. So we added these stem conductance curves to our watershed scale ecohydrologic model called Rhesus, so that in this enhanced ecohydrologic model, water being conducted through the tree passed through the stem before reaching the leaf. So in panel three, we ran our enhanced ecohydrologic model through a drought that peaked in September and October for oak species. The takeaway here is in the red box. Stem conductance in the dashed line is lower than leaf conductance in the solid lines during the peak drought for these oak species. This means that the water, that the flow of water in the whole tree is now limited or slowed by the stem and not by the leaf, an effect that hasn't been previously captured in most catchment scale ecohydrologic models. So reducing conductance through the whole tree in this way conserves water during droughts, which has several implications discussed in panel four. One is that reduced stem conductance in oaks leaves relatively, um, leaves relatively more water in the soil for nearby vegetation during droughts. Two, these relatively wetter soils enhance subsurface flow and subsidize water to downslope ecosystems during droughts. And three, forests mixed with more oaks may generate relatively more stream flow during droughts than those forests consisting primarily of maples. So my whole point here is that these drought response mechanisms, like reduced stem conductance, are critical to capture in, in catchment scale ecohydrologic models. Thank you. All right, perfect three minutes. Uh, also, as a reminder, we did end up having more submissions than we um, had time for for this session. And so we have additional pop-up talks that others recorded that are posted on the Quasi YouTube uh, website um, for those who want to continue watching talks. All right, next we have Daniel Hare with Web Applications for Performing Annual Temperature Signal Analysis to Evaluate Groundwater Contribution to Streams. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so I'm Danielle Hare. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Connecticut, uh, working with Ashley Hilton. And we have been focused on using paired air and stream temperature signals, so the whole annual signal itself, to inform us about how groundwater discharge influences stream temperature um, and what that means for the, and how we can extract the actual depth that the groundwater is emanating from. Um, the flow path itself. So we simply do this by parsing shallow and deep groundwater influence streams by analyzing how stream temperature deviates from the air temperature um, at annual time scales. We care about parsing these deep and shallow flow paths uh, contributing to streams for many different reasons, um, four of which I'll highlight here. One being the thermal regime. And I think this is what a lot of people think about when we think about groundwater discharge to streams. We think of groundwater discharge as imparting stability to the thermal regime of a stream. However, if that groundwater is coming from shallow sources, it can actually impart more variability in the stream temperature. So for that reason, we wanna parse deep and shallow. Shallow groundwater is also more inherently susceptible to land use changes um, and surface contamination. Uh, we also care about the differences between shallow and deep because they, um, they have different natural chemical profiles, which can have important implications for surface water quality and biogeochemical transformation processes. Shallow groundwater is also much more vulnerable to seasonal water table drawdown, um, which can influence transpiration as we've heard a lot about today. Um, so far and therefore can influence flow dynamics. Um, so that's the foundation of our research and why we care. Um, but our next step um, is we are converting this analysis that um, we've been working on to a web application uh, through the support of the Quasi Hydroinformatics 
Innovation Fellowship. And so the application's aim is for anyone with stream temperature data to be able to conduct this type of analysis and this type of parsing um, on their stream of interest. Uh, this web-based tool um, will be built on this um, data, anal uh, the scripts that we generated for a continental scale analysis. Um, that work was published in March of this year um, in Nature Communications. And, um, but yeah, so you can uh, upload your um, stream temperature data to HydroShare or Hydro clients, um, and then we'll be able to pull out um, air temperature data using Daymat, or you can use your own uh, air temperature data. And so our aim is to roll this out by the end of the year. Um, and we've also been putting emphasis on increasing the accessibility for Canadian stream temperatures. So trying to reach beyond uh, or trying to reach the North American um, continent itself, as well as some European sources. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, you should definitely check out the Nature paper, Nature Geo Communications paper, great paper, by the way. All right, so next we have Carl Ritger with Snow Today, um, and he has put a link uh, to data already in the chat. All right, All right Carl, take it away. Thank you very much, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining my pop-up talk. I'm Carl Ritger, and I'm a research scientist at the University of Colorado and the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'll be talking about state-of-the-art snow information available at the National Snow and Ice Data Center at CU Boulder. The website link is in the chat, as Sarah just mentioned. Uh, we produced near real-time data at a daily time step in 500 meter spatial resolution, including fractional snow cover, snow albedo, and the impact of light absorbing impurities like dust on snow albedo. The maps are spatially and temporally complete or gap filled. These useful observations of snow surface properties are easy to use for many hydrologic modeling efforts. Fractional snow cover can be used in modeling frameworks to identify areas with and without snow. Both snow cover and snow albedo can be used to help estimate snow melt during the spring. The impact of light impurities tells us how much faster the snow is melting than if it had been clean snow. The fractional snow cover products are more accurate than the standard NASA snow products like Mod 10A1, and the snow albedo products are more accurate than modeled estimates from snow aging models like the bioatmosphere transfer scheme or BATS that many people use when compared to in situ observations. While NASA standard products for snow albedo like mod 10A1 um, or whole pixel albedo like MCD43 work well for snow covered pixels, like you might find in Greenland or Alpine regions in midwinter, the products on snow today are designed to give accurate estimates over um, fully over partially snow covered pixels. Um, so uh, we've used data from snow today in publications to calibrate models or data assimilation schemes. Just to go over what we have on the website, the images on the upper right from left to right show for the Western United States, a snow cover percent map from white showing map colors from white to blue, um, a total snow covered area graph for this year, along with the minimum, maximum and interquartile range for the last 20 years, and snow covered days um, going from whites to purples um, with the average snow cover graph uh, duration on the right there, uh, very similar to the other one. Um, on the website, you can also select um, states or Huck 2 river basins at this time for areas of interest. The example on the lower left shows California, uh, the same maps and graphs that are above for the whole Western United States. And you can see California had a pretty poor snow year this year, as many people know. Um, after reaching a maximum, there was only one significant storm um, between February and May with a prolonged period of melt. Uh, the last figure on the lower right is simply a map of snow albedo. The values range from just over 0.5 to about 0.96, which is reasonable for snow. Uh, if you were to map snow albedo with other standard NASA products, uh, you'd see some really large underestimates because they don't account for mixed pixels. And we'll be adding graphs similar to the information I just discussed in context um, relative to the last 20 years over the next year. Uh, the data, the near real time data and the historical data are available um, from the website and it's likely that we'll be producing this globally in the next three years. Uh, so it's a great data set to start working with and work with in the future. Thank you. Great. All right. Next up, we have Brianna Wyatt 
with improving seasonal stream flow forecasts by incorporating soil moisture information derived from remote sensing. Brianna, take it away. Great, thanks Sarah. Uh, like she said, my name is Brianna Wyatt. I'm an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. Um, and sort of related to what Carl was just talking about, I'm sure many of you are aware of the NRCS stream flow forecasts that are produced in the Western United States. So those are shown in the, the bottom left figure here. So these forecasts are produced using uh, principal components regression with snow water equivalent data as the primary input. However, prior work has shown that if you incorporate soil moisture measurements into these forecasts, the accuracy of the forecasts themselves increases. Last year, I published a paper in uh, the Journal of Hydrology that showed you can actually take this PCR model outside of the Western US and apply it in rainfall dominated watersheds, so uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. And if you incorporate observed pre precipitation and soil moisture data, you can actually produce forecasts with comparable accuracy to those that are produced by the NRCS. However, precipitation and soil moisture data aren't available everywhere, especially if you're looking at a small watershed. So we wondered, can we use uh, soil moisture data derived from remote sensing to do the same uh, type of stream flow forecasting in unmonitored areas. So we focused on uh, three watersheds, one in Oklahoma, you can see them in this central figure here, one in Oklahoma, one in Kansas, and one in Nebraska. And in this PCR analysis, we used PRISM precipitation data, SMERGE soil moisture data. So SMERGE is a new retrospective product that estimates past soil moisture based on Landsat imagery. And then we also incorporated GRACE terrestrial water storage anomaly data uh, because several of these watersheds have a strong dependence on base flow from groundwater. So we used three different types of PCR forecasts, one which included precipitation only, another which included precipitation and soil moisture, and then the third which considered all three data types. And these are just some preliminary results that show that the soil moisture and groundwater data improve the forecast accuracy over the precipitation only forecasts. But you can see here the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency values around 0.5. These predictive ability of these forecasts aren't quite as high as our previous paper or the NRCS forecasts in the Western US. So we've still got a little bit of work to do, and this is ongoing work, like I said, uh, but overall it shows some really strong potential for improving surface water management in these rainfall dominated watersheds where currently there are no seasonal stream flow forecasts currently available. Thank you. Wonderful. Remember, let's, if any questions come up, uh, feel free to post them in the Q&A. Um, and we will have time at the end to answer any questions from the audience. All right, next we have Dan Myers and co-authors uh, talking about how much can calibration period choice influence water balances and hydrologic models. Hey, thanks, Sarah, and hello, everyone. So when we model hydrology, yeah, how do we fine tune the models and evaluate how reliable they are? Now, we usually compare the model outputs with real observations of data. Now, modelers will often split a data set of observations in half using the earlier period to calibrate the models and the later period to evaluate the models. And when I started modeling, that's exactly what I did. Um, yeah, however, yeah, what happens if the hydrological conditions are not the same between those two time periods? for the uh, typically unmeasured water balance components, including surface runoff, groundwater flow, and snow melt. So for instance, if a landscape was developed or a climate changed over the time period of the data set, will you get different water balance results if you put say, like the earliest 33% of the data to the calibration period and the latest 67% to the validation period compared to uh, just splitting it 50-50? So with my co-presenters, we performed a study involving the soil and water assessment tool, three United States watersheds, and 50 years of historic streamflow observations to answer this question. 
we found that there were rather broad effects of the arbitrary calibration and evaluation period choice across the water balance. So these charts show the mean monthly hydrological outputs in millimeters with different colored lines representing the different calibration strategies. Now, surface runoff simulations on a monthly basis could vary quite substantially due to different optimizations of the runoff curve number parameter in SWOT. And monthly simulations of groundwater flow to stream could vary by 100 to 200%, while monthly simulations of snow melt could vary by nearly 400%. And that was all just because of choosing a different time period of historical observations to calibrate the model. So you can see how this could create problems for uh, you know, studies involving like water quality, climate change impacts, or even best management planning. So how do we do this better? We suggest investigating the historical data and making an educated decision uh, for the choice of the calibration and validation period. So keep an eye out for differing hydrological conditions between the time periods, and then make a selective choice that best matches the goals of the study. And there are many tools or alternatives to help with this choice. And importantly, document the characteristics of the data, um, for example, means or medians in different time periods, and the reason for that choice. And that way, we can ensure that our models are giving the most reliable results to guide future research and important management decisions. And you can learn more about the study from my co-authors and I by reading our recent publication in Hydrological Processes. And I'm also happy to answer any questions in the chat. Thank you, Dan. All right, we will come back. Thank you for those submitting questions. We will come back to them at the end to address them. So please just keep submitting them. All right, next we have Leho Flores uh, with Navigating the Clouds on the Horizon, a vision for hydrologic modeling in the cloud. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Leho Flores, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geosciences at Boise State. Advances in the spatial resolutions of and process representations in coupled land atmosphere and hydrologic models allow us to simulate large water supply basins in increasingly fine spatiotemporal detail. This makes these models important tools for understanding the ways climate change might impact hydrologic systems, providing scientists and practitioners alike with scenarios and data that can help guide further, more detailed inquiry. These advances are enabled in part by freely accessible data sets that characterize projections of climate change under alternative scenarios and model configurations, open source models of both coupled land atmosphere and hydrologic processes like the weather research and forecasting or WARF model, intermediate complexity atmospheric or ICAR model, WARF hydro and PAR flow integ integrated hydrologic models. But perhaps most importantly, they're enabled by increasing access to high performance computing and data storage. The increasing complexity and resolutions of our model and data, however, present issues uh, with our traditional hydrologic modeling workflows that typically involve downloading all necessary model inputs, deploying models at scale to evaluate uncertainties in model forcings, parameters, and configurations, and storing output data for subsequent analyses and use. Additionally, the computational, computational expert perspectives are growing increasingly important in a variety of science, engineering, and even social science fields, meaning our colleagues in other disciplines are encountering the same challenges. The cloud offers a potential way to address this tension, but as of now, there are few specific use cases of deploying complex hydrologic models in the cloud, and even fewer training resources that are targeted to the hydrologic science community. Now imagine a future in which rather than bringing data to our computing resources, we stand up computational resources adjacent to that data in the cloud. These cloud-based high-performance computing resources would contain only the codes we need and could be configured in ways that allow for synergism between the hardware in the cloud and our scientific software. Moreover, when we're done with our research computing tasks, we can preserve the specific model configuration and software environment that allow others to duplicate it for their own use in other areas or with other input data. Advances in distributed interactive computing will also allow us to more easily and effectively explore and analyze large amounts of data to more quickly advance fundamental understanding from our model outputs 
while making it publicly available through uh, Kuwazi HydroShare. A new mid-career uh, advancement project funded by the National Science Foundation provides us the opportunity to undertake such a use case while also developing curricular materials to provide hydrologic scientists with the cloud computing skills that will be beneficial for them in both research and professional settings. In this project, we're going to be using WARF and ICAR in the cloud to create a large high resolution climate change ensemble in the Snake River Basin in the interior Pacific Northwest. We'll then use the outputs of these models to force an existing instance of the WARF Hydro model to create a corresponding large ensemble of projections of hydrologic change in the Snake River. Uh, to conclude, I look forward to at some point coming back to share the, both the scientific insights as well as to contribute improved education of hydrologic scientists of tomorrow through, for instance, Kuwazi's virtual university. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds fascinating. All right. Next, we have Scott Hemshaw with Watershed Data Science at the Event Scale. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Scott Hemshaw, a research faculty at University of Vermont, and I'm here to share some highlights of work myself and collaborators at UVM are pursuing around watershed data science at the event scale. An event for the purpose of the, this brief talk are the transient periods of river activity following rainfall, snowmelt, or other reoccurring uh, environmental phenomena. Compared to periods of base flow in rivers, events generally transport a disproportionate amount of water, solutes, and sediments, given they occur over a relatively small amount of time. Um, often relying on continuous sensors, uh, event analysis has helped us to understand under which conditions water, sediments, and solutes are exported. However, there remain some challenges to enabling watershed data science at the event scale um, that are hindering progress. So I'll mention three areas where we are working on new approaches to enable event analysis to scale into what we would call like big environmental data. First, the initial challenge we often run into is how to define what an event is. Um, this is a basic challenge, but a really important one. And we see in the literature various approaches being employed, especially around what variable we are using to define an event runoff, rainfall, concentration, or a combination of them, um, and how we handle multi-peak hydrographs. Here we're working on providing an additional method um, that detects and delineates events by employing both the stream flow and the concentration time series for situations where we want our event definition to explicitly include the period of concentration activity also. Um, second, another uh, Often common data analysis is performing a categorical event analysis, um, but this is often difficult to scale up to large data sets. Um, however, it can be useful in many situations to complement uh, calculation of hysteresis index or other metrics. So we're working here to adapt deep learning image and pattern recognition models to automate the classification of event CQ patterns. Third, as more and more sensor data is being recorded, we have or already will um, have captured more variability within CQ dynamics in our data sets. So how do we take advantage of this um, to explore watershed function? One element is to identify emergent trends and data um, and clusters of storm events. So we're working on two approaches, identifying CQ trends using multi-event um, trend and hot, uh, like a heat map analysis, and also to developing new uh, specific um, time series uh, data-driven clustering tools. Uh, if you're interested in any of these approaches, um, feel free to reach out and I'll also be giving a slightly longer um, version of this talk with my colleague, Dustin Kincaid at the uh, virtual summit, incorporating data science and open science in the aquatic sciences that is actually starting tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I need to follow up. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> All right. Next up is uh, Tao Wen with Sh Shale Network Database. Data bring energy stakeholders together. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? OK, thank you. So my name is Tao Wen, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Syracuse University. So on behalf of the Shell Network team, today I'm going to give you an overview of a decade-long community-centered research effort. 
that is the show network database. The show network database, I, I'm sorry, the show network project was first started in the year of 2011 by a collaborative team, including Penn State, University of Pittsburgh, Quasi, et cetera. And since then, the show network team has been funded by various agencies, including the National Science Foundation to coordinate various stakeholders of energy industry, including oil gas company, state regulator, community citizens, and nonprofit groups and academia to collect, compile, and format energy industry related or environmental data. We publish all the data into an online accessible database named a show network database while the quasi cyber infrastructure and namely both hydro client and hydro share we created a, a show network group to share resources on quasi hydro share website you are very welcome to join the group the major type of data ingested into the show network data is about groundwater and the surface water quality and for example major and trace elements methane concentration etc other types of data are also available we have been running an annual workshop, show network workshop in almost every May to invite various stakeholders of the energy industry to promote conversation among them. We have also been using show network database as a tool to educate the community, graduate and undergraduate students about the energy industry and how it might impact our world, our environment. As the map in the center, the top center shows, we started from the Marcellus shell located in the northeastern US. The greenish color denotes the extent of the Marcellus shell, which is one of the most prolific shell plates in the US. Each brown dot represents the sampling size as included in the shell network database. The size of the shell network database has increased dramatically since 2011, as the plot in the top and bottom shows. As of March 2000, uh, 2021, the shell network database has a total of over 1.5 million data values from over 50,000 sampling sites. In addition, we have also been using the Shonak database to understand how the energy industry might have impacted our environments, particularly on groundwater and surface water quality. I'm sharing two figures from two published papers here. And the top left figure shows a heat map in, in which the red color highlights the localized regions where unconventional gas drilling might have contaminated groundwater. This map was generated by a geospatial analysis tool, SWGT, that we developed in-house. And recently, um, we, are, we have also studied to ingest data from other show plays across the U.S. to create the national show, show network database. And based on the national database, we have been developing and applying machine learning models to groundwater quality data to highlight those sites likely contaminated by recent uh, unconventional oil gas drilling activity. You're very welcome to follow me on the Twitter or while my personal, personal website to track the progress of our research project. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Our next talk, which I mean, probably should have put earlier, but so be it because we've been talking about HydroShare a lot, is uh, David Tarbutton with HydroShare, a system for data sharing and collaboration in hydrology by hydrologists for hydrologists. So thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, some of you have already men mentioned Quasi HydroShare, and I wanted to use this time to give an update on HydroShare. And if you're not already doing so, to encourage you to start taking advantage of HydroShare, to share data and models developed in your research, to collaborate uh, and uh, to make your work reproducible. And if you're an instructor, to uh, support teaching. We've developed HydroShare over the last several years as a system for sharing and collaboration uh, in hydrology by hydrologists for hydrologists. Um, so it's operated by Quasi really for you. It's a web-based hydrologic information system uh, that serves as a community platform for water research. It was motivated by the idea that solving grand challenges or the difficult problems uh, in hydrology requires collaboration and teamwork. That requires integration of information from uh, multiple sources so that we can bring different lines of evidence uh, to bear on a problem, uh, which requires uh, data, data from multiple people, as well as computing. And we've worked uh, to set up HydroShare with these in mind. Uh, first, in terms of data, the left side of the slide shows uh, the growing recognition that uh, data and models are first class uh, products of research and should be shared. And we refer to the content in HydroShare as resources because it uh, comprises data as well as models like uh, SWOT, uh, Rhesus, 
which and we think of uh, separately the model programs, the sort of compute engines, as well as the instances, which is application at specific sites with the parameters, inputs and outputs. Um, and you've probably heard of the push towards making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as uh, part of the, the open mandate uh, that HydroShare supports. Um, we've also worked on computing, and that's the right side of the side, uh, with uh, Jupyter Hub platforms set up uh, in the Google Cloud by Quasi, and also uh, in uh, the National Science Foundation's uh, Exceed infrastructure, you can, on any uh, resource in HydroShare, click on the Open With button and open with one of uh, these uh, web apps that are uh, registered uh, and connected to that resource. And anybody can effectively set up a, a web app. So it's not only the, um, the Jupyter Hub platforms that, I, that I've mentioned, but uh, there's a linkage that anybody can set up an app that could act on on data and hydro share. Um, but with the, um, the Jupyter notebooks, it provides a really nice way to uh, document research procedures to combine code and explanatory text. Uh, code can be in Python and R used to prepare input for models and on the Exceed platforms, even submit some uh, high performance computing models. So there's an immediate uh, huge amount of value you can get by working with your uh, your data in HydroShare. And in the last year, we've made uh, important advances, streamlining HydroShare uh, and its link with the computational apps and also the way that uh, resources are organized. So there's a uh, fewer number of resource types. And then within a resource, you can have multiple data types, uh, for example, geographic rasters, geographic uh, features or shape files and models and data in the same resources. Um, so uh, we'd encourage you to uh, use this to uh, meet your sort of data management and data sharing uh, requirements. And I'm totally happy to answer questions. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have uh, Linda Lillenfeld about uh, let's talk about water. Linda speaks out. There's a quick video, but I can't play the sound apparently over Zoom. So technology is what technology is. So I will play the really awesome looking clip and Linda can take it away. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me see what's at the bottom of that slide. Okay, great. So. Um, I'm going to see myself as well, put myself back here. So I am not a hydrologist, you're probably well aware, and I created this project called Let's Talk About Water. And why did I do that? When you think of what you're seeing on the news today, the images of flooding in Europe and fires out west and subsidence beginning in Miami, in the Miami area, my question is, what is the relationship of the detailed information that hydrologists accumulate in these exquisite pop-ups that we've been seeing and that I watched for 15 years at AGU and the scale of the problem today, this keeps me up at night. And so I am a picture and film researcher. I work in documentary film, museum exhibits and books, and I use images to tell stories. So what I created with Quasi since 2009 is an event hosted on campus that is funded by Let's uh, Talk About Water at Quasi that gives you the opportunity as graduate students and associate professors to use film as a jumping off point to tell the story of what's happening with water in the climate today. And I love the use of the words water balance scaling up variability when you think again of the level of detail of what you're measuring and the images that we're seeing on the news every day now actually the idea of how we build a bridge between those two worlds is um, a very compelling challenge and it's actually considered broader impact in your nsf applications and so we have hosted these events at quasi with many applications and many, many beautiful events from one campus to another. In the course of the last few years, I realized that those events are wonderful, but somehow there needs to be a legacy product. 
And I realized that a short film, like a TikTok almost, in this day and age where young people, you directly, are so familiar with technology and so familiar with images, to somehow scale up from your posters to something that's in a two minute movie that you can share on campus with other people within different colleges and disciplines and with a wider public. In yesterday's session at the biennial, the idea of water science communication became a very, very important theme. And it's one that is not highly rewarded within the hydrologic community. And so in Canada at let's uh, talk about water.ca, there is a very beautiful website that was created under the auspices of Dr. Jay Famiglietti. He and I did the first Let's Talk About Water event at UC Irvine, which had the film, had a reception, had a panel discussion, very exciting. But now what we have at the, oh, oh my, three minutes are up, come to let's, so now Quasi is hosting a challenge for short films. September, there'll be the announcement. December will be the winners. You can join the competition at letstalkaboutwater.ca and contact your representatives on your campus. I reach out to the representatives who are listening to us to please send us your contact information and we can help you build a public relations campaign to your hydrologic students to be able to make a bridge between the beautiful hydrologic science made by quasi members and students. Thank you for listening and I love you all as you know. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> and thank you for letting me be a part of your family. Absolutely. I was lucky enough that Linda did a, an LTAL event on campus when I was a PhD student and it was wonderful. So I'm very excited to see how we keep building this, this relationship. All right. So our last, is it going to let me, there we go. All right, wrapping up uh, today on our talk. So remember, feel free to put any questions in the chat box. There have been some questions that I think we'll come back to in the end. Um, but next, uh, we have Jamil Ibrahim uh, talking about the American Institute of Hydrology's Certificate for Hydrologists. Great, thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you, Quasi. You muted yourself, I think. Sorry about that. All right, there we go. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you for to Quasi for the opportunity to actually present to you all today. I'm here representing the American Institute of Hydrology. I'm the current president of the American Institute of Hydrology. And um, the way I, I learned about AIH and certification for hydrologists uh, dates back to my undergrad years. And one of my former professors and, and mentor, now personal friend, uh, Jeff McDonald, one of our Quasi personal speakers, um, plen plen um featured speakers had the acronym PH on his business card. And I thought, I wanna, I wanna do that. that. That's me. I wanna be able to self-identify myself as a professional hydrologist. So for most of you all attending today, I can make a case for each of you to actually seek out uh, professional hydrologist certification. So AIH is the only organization in the US that certifies hydrologists and we certify hydrologists and hydrologic technicians. Uh, so similar to the engineering certification that some of you may be aware of, there are opportunities for early career professionals and for students to actually obtain professional hydrologist certification or hydrologist in training certification early on in your career so that you could actually make advances, be able to distinguish yourself um, from your peers and really demonstrate your knowledge and technical expertise in the field of hydrology. Now, um, for early career professionals and, and students seeking out that HIT certification, there's a fundamentals of a hydrology exam that covers groundwater, surface water, and water quality. Um, upon receiving a, a certain amount of years, about five years worth of experience, you then qualify for the professional hydrologist certification examination. And that examination is in a focus area of either groundwater, surface water, or water quality. So unlike the professional engineering exam, your professional hydrologist examination and your fundamentals of hydrology examinations are nothing but hydrology. Um, so we can make a case for why, um, personally, I think that the professional hydrologist certification provides a, a, a sense of identity. Um, 
when you type out your 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 email uh, address or actually including your email signature or your business card you see that ph acronym or the hit acronym at the end of your name and you instantly know what that means it's a professional hydrologist it's a hydrologist in training and it identifies you as a hydrologist in the industry and in the field um, as a student or early career professional seeking out opportunities for employment that also allows you to be able to distinguish yourself from others, again, demonstrating that, that area of expertise. We are seeing um, sectors, government sectors and industry right now requesting and requiring professional hydrology certification. And honestly, if I'm successful in my role as president of AIH, we'll see that happen even more prominently and more pronounced within the next couple of years. So I encourage you all to seek out and learn more about certification, certification types and membership in AIH. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any questions. All right. Okay. Um, thank you all very much. Let's have everyone's faces pop up. Let's close that. All right. So um, a couple of questions had come through um, here. Oh, yeah. Uh, including one that maybe we'll just start with this uh, most recent one from Tao, which is uh, for Jamil. Um, asking, would this certificate be sufficient where PEPG is needed? Um, sometimes environmental firms require PE or PG, or are they different cert certificates? Could you speak on that? Yeah, I could speak on that uh, just really quickly. It's a, it's a chicken and egg situation. The reason that you see firms and you know, entities seeking out the PE, PG certification is because they don't know about the PH. Um, we're making a case engaging with government agencies and legislatures around the country to actually make a case for the PH certification to be inserted into requirements. We're seeing that happen across the Corps of Engineers. We're seeing that happen across the state of California and various entities, state agencies and entities. So I think it's a matter of making a case. The more people see that PH certification, the more they're actually going to go ahead and seek it out. But um, and I'd encourage anyone who's a hydrologist should seek out the professional hydrologist certification. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so many thanks to our panelists who've been writing their answers in the Q&A. But um, if you're any like me and you cannot multitask and read answers while listening, I thought it'd be worth uh, reading some of the questions and letting you guys answer them here. So um, a question that Dan was proposed to Dan, um, uh, talked about for his results, are we thinking more long term or short term improvements that we would expect to see with uh, addressing our calibration uh, questions? So, Dan, do you mind uh, uh, answering that again? Okay. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And yeah, our study, we, we looked at a 50 year time period of data and we split that up into different calibration and validation periods. So, I, I would consider that to be like pretty long term. Um, yeah, we didn't, and we found that there were, well, we did find that there were like rather large impacts of the calibration period choice over that 50 year time period. Now for a shorter time period, say if you're calibrating a model with, or calibrating and evaluating with maybe five years of data or less, um, I would suspect that if there has been some kind of hydrological logical change, like a difference in climate, or if a, uh, a new shopping center just went in at the top of the watershed and changed the landscape that you could find that there would be differences based on the calibration period as well. And, and I also want to say that that'd be like some interesting future research. All right. Um, okay. So a question for Zineb. Um, could you please tell us one more time what um, what your was your case study and why you chose that case study for your project? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, sorry, I have poor connection. Please uh, again. <laughs> yeah, do you mind um, telling us a bit more about um, why you chose what your case study was, your location of choice, and why you chose that? Uh, this uh, catchment uh, has a big soil erosion in the Iran, and uh, we uh, we has sorry we have um, so many flood events in the catchment, and uh, we needed to uh, investigate the. Um, soil erosion and find the uh, suspended sediment uh, source in the catchment. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, no Another question for uh, Jamil, because um, this one I want to know the answer to. So we're gonna we're gonna pick this one. Um, do you see graduate programs designing requirements to help students achieve either the HIT or the PH certification, or you know uh, uh, having AIH work with graduate programs to make sure the correct courses are being offered so that students will be able to to meet these requirements? Absolutely. You know, yeah. Absolutely. This is something Anne and I have talked about. It's such a nebulous, uh, you know, discipline that fits in so many different places, yeah. and there are very few places where there is a hydrology program. Yeah, absolutely, and it's something I've been engaging with Jared on and trying to promote within Quasi. Uh, honestly, I mean, I went to graduate school and, and graduated with a hydrologic sciences graduate degree. I would love to see institutions that offer degree programs, either undergrad or graduate degree programs in hydrology offer up and encourage um, obtaining obtaining that fundamentals of hydro taking that fundamentals of hydrology examination and obtaining the HIT certification upon graduation as your demonstration of the fact that you've completed the coursework and here you are you're certified as a hydrologist in training after actually completing your coursework. So that's something I'd love to be able to engage with universities and institutions offering degree programs in hydrology, absolutely. Um, in terms of the course offerings and, and tailoring those course offerings, um, that's something that could definitely be discussed, but honestly, any, any graduate program or an undergraduate program offering degree in hydrology is multidisciplinary in nature and would cover the prerequisite course requirements for qualifications for that fundamentals of hydrology exam. But great question, Sarah, and something I'd love to be able to engage with Quasi on, as well as in other institutions on. All right, and then our last question before we will um, have everyone switch over to Nicole's. So this is for you, Morgan. Hopefully we can answer it pretty quickly. Um, why did you select SVM as the machine learning approach? Uh, you showed four years of data from your preliminary results. Were there other years that showed lower agreement that might itself be a key signal not captured in the training data? Hey, Anne, uh, thank you for the question. So a support vector machine was just kind of like a first pass approach. Um, I don't have any reason to say it's going to be the best approach necessarily. It was just sort of a proof of concept and for our preliminary results. Um, I also liked it because there was a fair amount of sanitizing I had to do to include the groundwater data. And so for the 2017 to 2018 model, um, I only had about 300 data points. So SVMs do pretty well with uh, small amounts of data like that. Um, and then, yeah, I had four years of data. Um, yeah, I mean, that could, that could be the case. Um, that's kind of why I need more data to see whether the model generalizes. Um, I would say I'm more concerned about um, the model generalizing to different locations or species than I am uh, temporally, but that could be the case. All right, one final thanks to all of our pop-up speakers. Um, these, this recording will be posted on the YouTube page within about 24 hours, and we have the additional uh, talks posted there already. I hope you all can switch to the other Zoom room with me for Nicole Gasparini's lecture, which starts at 1 Eastern Daylight Time, wherever you are. It's the next one. And then, of course, join us again um, at 2.10 for the next GatherTown virtual uh, uh, lecture. The link to the next Zoom lecture is in the chat uh, for everyone. And so thanks, everyone. This actually worked. Go us.